All right, we'll go ahead and get started. This is Behind the Scenes of Science. The goal of this webinar today and the series as a whole is to give you a sense of careers in science, different pathways. How do you go from high school to now? And what does a day in the life of someone who works in the field of science look like? I'm gonna start by asking Delissa, our guest today, some questions. And we'll have lots of time to take questions from you on both Zoom and YouTube. So please make sure to enter those questions using the Zoom Q&A function or the YouTube chat. So to introduce uh, herself, Delissa, we have your video. But before we play that, do you want to just briefly say who you are? OK, so welcome, everyone. Thank you for inviting me into your classrooms and into your homes this morning. My name is Delissa McMillan. I am a research associate at the Allen Institute for Brain Science. Um, my job is very diverse here at the Allen Institute because along with my day-to-day -day laboratory work, I am also the safety committee chair for the Institute. Um, so I have, I, the work I do reaches across the Institute um, and throughout everything we do. All right, well, I'm gonna play Delissa's intro video and then uh, we're gonna do some questions. And remember, you can put questions in Q&A at any time. There we go. Can you see uh, the video now? Delissa? Great. I'm Delissa McMillan. I'm a research associate at the Allen Institute for Brain Science. I'm also a knitter, a Minecrafter, and a mom of three silly boys. My family came from St. Vincent and the Grenadines when I was about eight years old. My mom saw snow for the first time and that led our family on this wild immigration journey coming here. I went to undergrad school at Buffalo State College in Buffalo, New York. From there, I went to Adelphi University and started a virology grad program very bored in biochemistry one day and <laughs> saw a bunch of ROTC guys outside and decided I was gonna join the army. After a four year tour, I got out and I joined the West Virginia Air National Guard because I wanted to be a flight medic. I flew a lot with the West Virginia team. My husband was stationed out here, so we transferred here to Washington State. Stayed home for a couple years to raise my boys. And during the hot chocolate race, me and my middle son were running and he looked up and he saw this big building and he was like, Mom, what's the Allen Institute? And it was like, I don't know. And he was like, well, can you work there? And so that sent my journey applying to work at the Allen Institute. And I was accepted to work in the molecular biology department on the RSEQ team to help build this roadmap, basically, of the brain. We take care of the basic science. We take care of the things that other scientists necessarily can't do on a grand, larger scale. Most labs in a year can maybe do 50 or 100 cells, and that's where their budget may lie. Whereas we do thousands of cells per year, we do thousands of cells per week. One thing I think about now is that I don't want to be the last and only in the room anymore. One of my goals at the Allen Institute is that in the next few years, that when I look around, I'm not the only. And that's the measure of my success. I love that video. So your video does cover part of the answer to this question of what was your science journey from high school to now? But if you can talk us through a little bit more of any details that you want to share about that, that would be great. Right. So one of the details that we did leave out in the video is, so after my name, there's the, the, the word alphabet soup. Um, that I like to, to call it. So my degrees, I have a bachelor's in biology and I have a master's in biotechnology specialized in, in bioinformatics and I have an MBA, which goes completely into that field. But when I was in high school, I realized that I loved science. But you know, normally when we think of science, everybody's like, oh, you like science, you become a doctor, you become a nurse. And there's those career paths that are geared out for you. Um, but I found teachers who were really interested in getting me to apply um, to scientific experimentation. And I realized I was really good at doing science experiments and then competing. Um, I did a lot of science competitions. And what you'll realize when you leave high school and junior high, that there are science competitions at the college level and further that it gets your, you get into the lab, you do a lot of work. Um, I worked when I went at, in Buffalo, 
I actually um, worked in the laboratory at Roswell Park Cancer Institute for Dr. Maria Baer, and she was studying um, multi-drug resistance in acute myeloid leukemia. One of the best things about being an RA at my level is that I'm not pinned into one exact um, definition of study. Whereas a PhD scientist will have studied years and years in neuroscience, and they may study years and years in immunology. Whereas I can look at the breadth of science and go, what is my what excites me today? And so I think that is my takeaway from high school and college in my experience, is science should excite you, it should drive you, and it has, should have the potential, not only to change you, but to change the world. So your work obviously inspires you on a day-to-day -day basis, yeah. both before the pandemic and now. What does an average day look like? So I must say that science is not an individ individualistic um, event. So for me, what I do every day does not happen without the phenomenal team that, that I work with. So we have Darren, Michael, Christina, Amy, Ton, Janita, Nathan, Jeff, and our manager, Kim. Everything I tell you about today happens because of our team. So on a given day, so in order to, so I work in the RNA-seq lab. So we do single cell sequencing. So what we do is we take individual cells and we go from taking that from either a human, and we work on different species. So it could be human, it could be mouse, it could be macaque, it could be, um, I know we have um, opossums, it could be a wide range um, of species that we get these cells. And we- What the kind of cell? The neuron, the neuron from the brain. So we work on brain cells and we get those and we amplify them. So my given day, you know, my day starts at where most people at the Institute day starts at the coffee machine because the Institute runs on caffeine and sugar. <laughs> um, so then I get back, I see my schedule for the day, whether I'm on amplifications, libraries, um, whether I'm on DNA cleanup um, and everything's a process. So we all have to do our part along the line to get to the final product. 60 to 80, 70% of my day is in the wet lab. I am either amplifying cells. And when I amplify cells in most basic labs, you may amplify five or six cells a day. In our lab, I will amplify 284 um, given cells in one day. What does um, amplification mean? So amplification means that we're gonna take these individual cells, we're going to break them open and we're going to ramp up during uh, doing PCR reactions, polymerase trait um, chain reactions, and we're going to increase the number so that we can take a closer, deeper look when we sequence them out. So we need more copies of the individual regions that we're, we're interested in. The regions of DNA? Right. So the regions of the DNA, which we convert to RNA. And so we have to then amplify those. So we have more copies of it. And so we use some, some of it to do different experiments um, as we go along for different regions of interest. Um, and so my day is either doing amplification or libraries. When we do libraries, we're prepping um, the amplified samples to get them into a form where we're tagging them, to get them to a form where when we send them off to be sequenced, that it's recognizable and it gets them back into a, a form that we can understand. So I spend 60 to 7% of my time in the wet lab doing that. Another part of my job is also helping with the initial analysis. Um, I hope everyone listened to Jeremy's um, talk last week where Jeremy is on the analysis side of the house. So when the, when the data comes back in, Jeff, myself, Michael, we pull in that data that we get back after we spent time in the wet lab, and then we analyze it. And then we get it to a place where it's then readable by our bioinformatics team and the wonderful team with Jeff, with um, Jeremy, um, and they take it and they make it to where then we can present it to everyone out there in papers and to the world. Um, post so pen, oh, I was going to say, if you didn't get to watch uh, Jeremy speak last week, you can see that on the Behind the Scenes of Science series page or the Allen Institute's YouTube. Right. And so post, well, during pandemic, the wet lab um, part of our job had to come to a, a pause. I'm not saying that it came to a pause, but we had so much back data that we've had been processing for years. The pandemic actually gave us a unique opportunity to actually 
analyze and go dive deeper into a lot of that data. So I spent a lot of my time analyzing data, putting together protocols so that if I walked away from the lab or something, or I move on to a new opportunity, that the next RA up, the next person up can then take over that work. Um, and I think that's one thing you should learn in high school and learn that when you walk away from your lab notebook, someone else should be able to pick up and reproduce that work. And it should be very clear what your work is doing. And that's important in what I do. My work is, in, it's durable. My work can be reproduced every time by anyone. And so that's a lot of we do. We also did a lot of Bozak, which I encourage any one of you to, to log on to our Mozak game and join us where it's real science, where you get your hands on and help us to trace neurons that will go ahead and help us here at the Institute, at the Institute for Brain Science work, um, do our work. And so we did a lot of Mozak, we did a lot of analysis. And now, even though we're still in the pandemic times and we're figuring out our new normal, a lot of us has gone, gone back to the lab because we have very pressing work. Our work is here to drive science. And so we have to get back into the lab as safely as possible. So now we're in a, a phase where some of us are back um, and some of us are still working with that data that's still always coming in. So you can find uh, some of the data that has come from Delissa's work on our website at brain-map.org. And I'm gonna show you what some of that looks like. Delissa, would you like to explain what we're looking at here? So we're looking at some of the, the final analysis. I know Jeremy last week did a great job at, at explaining um, this heat map. And one of the great things is that this heat map represents thousands of cells that have been, um, have been analyzed and how they relate to other cells. Um, you know, every cell in our body affects another cell. And so, and, and, one of the things we look at is gene expressions. And what this map is showing you is the different markers, the genes expressions and stuff like that um, that go on. And I, I I'm gonna point everyone back to Jeremy because I think Jeremy did a really great um, job last week at explaining um, this, this map. He's really great at looking and um, defining this. Um, what I wanted to talk a little bit about is um, how we do what we do. So I did mention that we do, in my piece, we do thousands of cells. So one of the cool ways is that it, on our team, as you see, there's about eight of us on our team. So we necessarily can't do a thousand cells manually by ourselves. Some pro procedures like amplification have to be done manually, but we have some of the coolest robots. Um, and I think Caitlin has some, um, why don't we do the, um, has some, yeah. So here is one of our robots. We have two of these and this is the Bravo. So Bravo we use, um, primarily for our DNA cleanup and education because we have to do it repetitively over and over and the best way to be consistent and have to do that is to use a book um, and it's programmed to exactly pick up the amount of liquid you need and it's programmed to repeatedly go back and forth to um, the instrument Get everything. So we use a lot. This is one of our Bravo, one of our Bravo robots, which we use. Um, there is. Would you, should we do the tour? Do you think? Or I'll pull it right up. Hey. So another unique thing about our lab is our lab is set up in a way to facilitate. Um, our work and it's it's meant to give an ease to the way. So when you set in when you set up a, um, your work when you're in your lab, you should think about how things. So here it is. So we wave and let him in, so we don't have to touch the doors. Once you head into the lab, as you can see, we have thermal cycles, th thermal cyclers, which. If this is how we do the PCR reaction. As you walk in, you see we have PCR workstations and these are clean workstations and where we go ahead and we do amplifications in. As we walk into, this is what we call the Bravo room. And here are the two Bravos that we just showed you, one running through its cycle before. As we walk around, lots of freezers, 
That's a, we have plate sealers, more PCRs. We have lots. We have 11 thermal cyclers in order to do what we do every day. Um, yeah, centrifuges. A lot of you should be very familiar with centrifuges. We have several. This is an open Tron machine. It's another robot that we're working with also to help us do a lot of the consolidation of our samples um, that we send out. We have lots of PCR hoods. Um, the, this is our, what we consider our dirty section. Um, and we keep everything section. So if something is preamp, it's before. Oh, that, that's the fragment analyzer. So I know many of you may be familiar with um, electrophoresis. So instead of running an agar gel, we use a fragment analyzer. More thermal cyclers. Oh, this is the Mantis. It's another small robot that we use. And then we have the Integra, which is a pipetting system. Thank you, Ton, <laughs> for giving us this quick tour around the lab. And this is our TEDx area. Um, a lot of you may know like 10X Fragment Analyzer. Those are the really big things that are coming out now to help increase how many cells that can be done and analyzed at any given time. And I know some of your teammates made that video of the lab tour. Yes, yes, Tan and Amy. I'm currently not in the lab. And as I say, one of the, the best things is, is we, we work as a team at the Allen Institute. Nothing is accomplished without us all working together. Uh, I think we know the answer to this one by now, but what is your favorite thing about your job? Well, let's say, what's your favorite thing about your job besides working with your awesome team? <laughs> besides my awesome team, I think the knowledge that what I do makes a difference. I think what I, when, you know, we leave our families every day to go into work. And so it's great to work with a great team, but at the end of the day, science is supposed to help the everyone at large. And I know the work that we do each and every day makes that difference. So we, so some people see us doing parts. So we are bu about building the part list. We are about building this really awesome roadmap of the brain to eventually help scientists who are starting smaller diseases and smaller defects within the brain. What, what my job is to, and our job is to do, is to help them build that foundation. We, we show what normal is. We show what a brain should be at highest functioning. We show what cells are supposed to do, what cells are supposed to act like. And then that helps scientists to not have to recreate that wheel. So the best part of my job is knowing that we accelerate science and what we do is, is enduring because for years and years ahead, as we keep going on in science and we keep moving science ahead, we're able to accelerate how fast we find that cure for Alzheimer's, how fast we help those with autism function at higher levels and how we help Parkinson's, how we help so many different things. So it's all about driving the science. So that's what's most exciting to me. So those of you in the audience, we're going to start taking questions from you for Delissa in just a moment. So please remember to put those into the Q&A or the chat. So this leads very well into a question from our audience. Uh, what were some struggles that you faced while studying in college and I'll add in grad school? So in college for me, I, as I was the, I move a lot. I'm, I'm I have, um, I have ADHD. And so for me, a struggle was understanding how I learned. So in elementary school and in high school, teachers, you're very well structured. Teachers pick up on these things, they structure. In college, for me, it was very difficult because I was on my own and I had to figure out how did I learn and how to structure. Um, also growing up, I'm in a, I'm gonna be very honest, I'm in a field where you don't see many people who look like me. And it's very it, it was very difficult back in the 90s going to school where it was basically me and no one else. Um, and, and that in certain re areas that I studied in was very tough. As I went on um, and people were able to see that my science is just as good, I am just as good as Nasada, and I worked harder at it it broke down some of those barriers. So I had a learning disability where my ADHD and I had to work and figure out for myself what was my learning style and how to best move forward with that. But then I had this ex external thing where I had people 
who looked at me and just simply placed that I didn't belong. And it was very verbal for some of them and it was very underhand for others, but I was determined. So my biggest takeaway is to find a group that can help support you. Um, they may not always, because I'm in this work, it may not always look like you, but they support you, support your signs and they believe in you. Find that tribe and build on that and then support each other. And that is where the best signs will come out of. What has been the biggest effect of COVID on your work life and your research? And also in finding groups that you connect with and support, that support you. All right, so in COVID times, we've had to change around how we do science. We, in the lab, we had to change around how we interact. Our team is super close. So there are a lot of times you go when we're right on each other, looking, helping each other, um, see what we're doing and, and talking these things out. We have to learn to back away. Another thing that COVID time is, is opened up opportunities for me. I became the study coordinator for our first human study at the Institute for our COVID study. And so I have been coordinating um, that effort. And so it, it's opened up that whole avenue and interest in me that I'm, I'm interested in finding do, working with subject matter, working with people coordinating on those levels. Um, so we had to change, especially when it comes to the safety aspect at the Institute. As the safety committee chair, I look and I help the team to look at what's safe because we have to do social distancing. We have to be careful because we don't want to be sick. We Science can't run if the team is sick. So we have we work on all those things. So it's about being conscious and be cautious. Um, also supply slow down. That's another thing that many people don't think about. When we're saving equipment for the nurses, like gloves, masks, and all that stuff, we use those also in large quantities. We have to be mindful of we can't change gloves out every five seconds um, just because we could. We have to be mindful that every supply we use takes away the potential from the supply chain that can lead that maybe needed some in another industry like the hospitals, nurses, and staff. So we also are mindful of that in everything we do. We have another question from the audience. What are the robots purpose? What is their job? And I know that all of the robots have different jobs, but briefly, oh, what, what right. is Right, so the Bravo that you just saw a while ago, that's a liquid handler. Um, Caitlin, do you have the Ham Hammies, Hamilton's um, video? Can we play that? Um, I am not sure which video goes with which robot. Oh, so if play you a robot. tell us what their role is in right. the, the workflow as a whole. Right. So the workflow as a whole is all is to take away some of the strain on the human, on the human doing the work. And, and that's us, the RAs. So we, lots of the robots basically take over the, the job that are repetitive that we would have to do. So when we pipette things, that's, and you see when we pipette things over and over, that will cause strain and pain and reduce the longevity of an RA, whereas a robot can do those many, many times. So we have liquid handlers that will actually pipette down to 0.2 microliters of a solution into, into the tubes that we need, into the plates that we need. We have robots that will consolidate. So they will take liquid the samples out of single tubes and put them into bigger ones. So the job of the robot is to take away the demand of the physical demand from the RAs and also help us can do consistent science. And that's what the robots are for. They're consistent, they're repetitive. And so we have liquid handlers, we have, have um, sample movers, um, we have, so the fragment analyzer, I like to think of it as a, as a semi-robot where instead of running electrophoresis gel, we, it's ran um, on the fragment analyzer. So this is Hamilton. So Hamilton is a liquid, um, is a liquid handler. Here it's prepping some of our um, library water plates. So it will take in each one of those tips, it will take a different quantity of water. And because we're trying to normalize the, the RNA down to, to a certain level that it's able to take and, and have it and, and have it sequenced. So in order to do that, we have we add water, we add um, sterilized water. And so what this liquid handler does, ham, I call him Hammy, what ham, ham, the Hamilton does is take up different quantities of water and place it in different tubes. So this is a 96 well plate. 
and each well may need a different quantity of water where it would be, if we did it, we would have to do it individually many times over whereas the Hamilton can do an entire set of 12 at one time. Yeah, so we have time for just a couple more questions. Um, how do you believe that biology is important to understanding robotics and AI? And I'd actually reverse the question as well. How does robotics and AI help you in biology? So we've covered robotics. Right, so we covered robotics, they help us in. So with, with AI, we have to understand the biology. If we wanna turn something into an artificial intelligence, we have to figure out intelligence. We have to figure out how the human mind works. To some levels, I know we work on what's physical. We work on what is actually there. We work on the cells. We work on the basic level. We have other parts of the Institute that are working on the higher frame and the, the higher level of what makes a human, what makes a person think? How does a person interact and how do they relate? So I think it's important that in order for us to move to AI, we have to understand what we're, AI is just simply a representation of the human. And so we have to understand the human. So it all works together and it's all basically a stream. And then one day AI comes to back and it should help the human and help the, and help the people it's been created for. We have another question from our audience. What was your experience like when you first started doing science and when did you realize this is what you wanted to do? And I will also say we are at time, but Delissa has agreed to stay a couple minutes longer to make sure we answer all those questions. We understand if you might not be able to stay, but the video will be posted of this talk afterwards. So I realized I wanted to do actual research-based science when I was in undergrad. So I knew I liked being in the lab and I liked working um, on experiments. So back in high school and in elementary, I had that experience doing um, experiments, but on a higher level in college, I was able to basically drive and pick what I wanted to study and pick what I like to do. Um, but then I got bored. One of the things about my story should tell you, you can switch directions and then come back and figure it out. I joined the military. I spent 10 years serving in the military. I was a medic. As a medic, I then understood one critical thing. If everyone is treating, because everybody wants to be doctors, everybody wants to be nurses. If everyone is wants to treat the patients, who's creating the next great thing to help that doctor and to help that nurse. My, what drove me as a medic being out in the field was that I needed a thing, but no one had come up with that thing, but I needed to save my patient. And I, once my tour was done, I realized my goal was to go back and develop that thing. And so a lot of the work I've done was to help develop the things that will one day and eventually go out to help people. So that is what drives me in science. All along my career has always brought me back to doing research because it's taught me, well, I can't do this without this. So who's doing this? So why not me? Yeah. So we have time for one last question, which is, can you tell us about your Zoom background? What? Can you tell us about your Zoom background? Oh, so my Zoom background is me. So I have, I met a wonderful artist who's also a scientist um, in California and she does, she takes, um, she asks scientists to do pieces on them who come from non-traditional background. So as a black female who have a degree in bioinformatics and work in the brain science, um, she thought she had never really met anyone with my unique skill set. She wanted to capture me in her artwork. And so this was her representation of me combining the fact that I do molecular biology and I also am into the data and into the data science. And so this is a combination of that work that she does. I love that so much. <laughs> Well, thank you everyone for joining us here today. We will be back next week with Melissa Hendershot, a scientist in our cell science division. And she will be talking about some of the work that she does with human cells. So I hope you'll be able to join us then. You can also watch the video of Delissa afterwards on the Behind the Scenes of Science series page. And I hope you will register and join us for future webinars in this series. Thank you so much for being here, Delissa. Thank and you. thank you everyone for being here in the audience today.